Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Bunker. My name is Rhea Somerville and today I am talking with an artist who is half Japanese, half Kiwi, but is currently living in Perth because she married a lovely man and they are living in Perth together. However, she's still represented by galleries in New Zealand, so she exhibits shows here quite often. So today it's going to be me and Aiko Robinson talking about her artistic practice. So Aiko, what are your connections to Japan? So my mother is Japanese, so I am half Japanese. Um, I've grown up in Christchurch, but we've always had like a strong connection with the Japanese community yeah. in Christchurch. Um, and yeah, we used to visit Japan maybe like once every two years or so when we were younger. Um, so we've always, um, I've got a younger brother too, but we've always felt very connected to mm. Japanese culture and particularly sort of like my mum's family and stuff like that, yeah. So did you experience much Japanese culture growing up in New Zealand? Yeah, so um, we um, attended Japanese school on a Saturday, so a weekend school, um, and we um, got to know lots of like Japanese families, a lot of families like ourselves, like um, kind of a little bit... Um, you know, mix we got um, uh, like a Kiwi father or a Kiwi mother um, and a Japanese mother or father kind of thing. Um, so a lot of like half Japanese families and things like that. Um, so I think like um, for myself, I definitely really enjoyed going to Japanese school, getting to know the Japanese community and being able to speak Japanese with friends and things. So yeah, definitely um, felt like very yeah connected to Japanese culture in New Zealand too. Did you stay there all through school? Yeah, so um, I was there from um, age five all the way up to 15. So I did um, I did have a few um, classes that I missed due to tennis. So I had another mm. commitment as well. And that all, you know, happened on Saturdays. Um, but for the most part, um, I was um, full attendance and... Um, um, yeah, I graduated, did the, you know, graduation speech and everything. Yeah, it was like, um, it was great, yeah. I think one of my favourite parts about going to the Japanese school was the fairs and the festivals and things. Oh, yeah, I love so those. Good. So fun. So good. I actually kind of liked those days, um, m- maybe even more than how, it's because it's um, really um, kind of progressed now. And it's such a huge event now, isn't it? Like the um, Japanese festivals and stuff like that. Um, And it's so grand, but I kind of liked when it was more kind of like intimate. So have you spent a lot of time actually in Japan? Yeah, so um, we would generally um, mainly go to Osaka because that's where my mum's from. So that's where we have all our family. Um, But... I guess like when we got a bit older, when we had studies, it got a little harder to go as frequently. Um, But um, both me and my brother have sort of decided to, you know, go and spend time there um, separately. And so I had the opportunity um, recently in 2017 to go for three years um, on the um, MIX scholarship. Um, So it was like a little government funded scholarship um, to study in Japan. So that was huge for me because I think that my Japanese got a lot better. I felt a lot more confident in the country and the culture. Um, Because I think, yeah, learning about it from New Zealand and actually living there is such a different experience. So, yeah, I I loved that experience so much and um, definitely made a lot of friends and... Yeah, I just, I think I feel a lot more comfortable there. So I've briefly talked about the Mixed Scholarship Program in a previous episode, and Aiko actually got to go to study fine arts. Where did you go to university? So I studied at Tokyo University of the Arts, um, Gede. Um, Mm. So I um, was in the um, printmaking department there and learned how to do Japanese with block printing. Um, oh, so, fun. so much fun, yeah. Um, but somewhere along the lines, I kind of like um, ended up in um, copper plate etching. <laughs> so, like, kind of left that behind for a little while um, and kind of explored lots of different mediums while I was there. Oh, that sounds so amazing. So, do you want to tell us a little bit about your practice? Yeah, sure. So, um, my um, work is um, inspired by Japanese shunga prints, which is. Um, 
It um, literally translates to spring pictures. It's a form of erotica that flourished in the 17th and 19th centuries. Um, I've always taken to it because it's um, very much kind of about celebrating sex. It's very empowering. I find as a woman, it's um, really beautiful to look at. Um, I think a lot of the tension is on um, like the kimono details and a lot of um, sort of beautiful like motifs throughout it. Um, so I have been making works um, that um, honour those um, historical pieces while also bringing in um, sort of some modern kind of um, takes on it. So yeah, just to give a wee brief history of Shinga, it was produced by the thousands during the Edo period. So that would be around 1600 to 1870. And like Aiko said, it translates to spring pictures and it's an erotic art style which features graphic images of sexual activity. And that's how people would normally describe it. The word graphic kind of alludes to something a bit more aggressive than what you would see in Aiko's work, for example. And so like ukiyo-e, shunga is made through ink paintings or woodblock prints. And it would normally be on scrolls or in texts generally depicting male and female couples, but there would also be versions of male and male couples. Unlike many of the world's religions, Shinto was actually quite positive about sex. So where you see religions where sex is deemed as sinful or shameful, in Shinto there was a lot of celebration of sex as a part of nature, a way to bring pleasure and to express love and it was also the reason for the creation of deities. So in Shinto sex was never deemed inappropriate. And even though Shunga was banned by the Japanese shogunate in 1722 it was still produced and still circulated just like other illegal things, banning something doesn't make it stop, I suppose. In 2013 to 2014, the British Museum put on an exhibition about Shunga. And it was curated by a man named Timothy Clark. And he is quoted as saying, At its best, Shunga celebrates the pleasures of lovemaking in beautiful pictures that present mutual attraction and sexual desire as natural and unaffected. The genre's artistic conventions include facial expressions conveying a sense of deep pleasure, exaggerated sexual organs that are the source of that pleasure, and surroundings filled with gorgeous textiles, accessories, food, and drink. And that really talks similarly to how Aiko's talking, as it's talking about celebrating sexual pleasure and it's not really the same as a porn or pornographic image that you could find in western culture. And what originally drew you to Shunga uh, to inform your practice? Um, I actually, um, in my third year at um, Elam, I... Um, I was told by my um, tutor that my works were too cute and too feminine and like essentially just too safe and I was just like, whoa, <laughs> I'll give you something that isn't too cute, too feminine or too safe, you know, and so like I was um, in the library looking at some ukiyo-e um, books because I was trying to, I guess, essentially, um, yeah, look at my own heritage because I thought that maybe that would feel more meaningful so that was like a good basis to start and then I was looking through these books and there's just like so much shunga in these books and it was um, really interesting to me because um, I guess like every ukiyo-e artist um, had sexual work in their mm. repertoire so it wasn't that they um, it's not like me where they like have dedicated their entire practice to sexy works but um they, they ha would have like landscapes and um, beautiful portraits of 
woman and then randomly all these erotic works and I was just like what is this this is so cool and so um I came back like next day with some um just some like very quick drawings um that were um um kind of loosely inspired by some of those works um that I spotted um in these books and and I felt like it was mainly about the shock factor at the start, just to be like, ha, you know, like, look at me making this, like, super sexy work. Um, how's that for, for you kind of thing? But I think over time what I realised was that I, um, I definitely liked the mentality around it and I, I really liked um, um, what I was seeing in these works. And it was, um, I think there was a lot of the quality in those works, um, a lot of tenderness. There were um, some works that were um, that showed um, rape scenes as well, for example. But um, what you notice in those works is that the the men committing the crime um, are shown in a really um, shameful way. Their their faces are ugly and distorted, and what they're saying is like this is not okay. Um, mm. And then the works with where they were more about the love um, there's a lot of um, really beautiful men with very tender expressions um, and I think those sorts of things were also really interesting to me um, so yeah I, I definitely spotted a lot of things about it that felt like um, there was a lot of potential to sort of um, bring it into sort of like a contemporary um, space and um, bring back some of the um, ideas that I was really fond of um, into sort of yeah contemporary society as well I felt like it was still very relevant yeah. I did actually notice on some of your works that we had in the gallery that I worked in that with the homo erotic works with two men you actually had used condoms and you're promoting that safe sex narrative which was fun. Yeah, so there are some little like kind of modern things that I'm bringing in because I guess the thing that was lacking in those works is the um, yeah um, safe sex and I think like you know um, often even in pornography is something that we overlook too because um, in the whole like um, frenzy of you know the passionate moment you know you just um, go for it and forget about um, the, the protection but I think in my works I kind of wanted to show those like awkward <laughs> moments too where you know you, you are actually um, being, being safe and yeah talk, talking about that as well yeah yeah and going back to the Japanese aspect what areas of Japanese culture other than Shunga I guess do you find really influences you in your practice yeah, mainly yeah. Shunga, um, and I definitely, um, I've always loved um, kimono, so my um, my mum um, is part of a um, kimono club mm -hmm. um, in Christchurch, um, she um, started getting into it about like maybe um, 12 or so years ago I think, um, and she's got this incredible collection mm -hmm. now um, of both, um, you know, beautiful sort of antique silk ones as well as sort of like contemporary ones that you can actually wash in the washing machine now as well um so like um I look at all of the details on her um kimono and I'm like oh you know like these are so beautiful um so I've been taking a lot of notice of things like that I think really um my interest in Japan um in, in terms of my art and you know in relation to my art is um definitely comes from sort of traditional culture, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so um, the shunga, um, ukiyo-e in, in general as well, um, and also yeah, kimono. I also noticed that in some of your other drawings, you often used natural elements as well. So yeah. I've always drawn the um, the matsu pine trees. Um, I I use those. Um, mainly because I kind of wanted to avoid um, kind of imagery of um, seasons. So I've chosen like kind of like evergreens. I didn't yeah. really want to bring in too much like um, cherry blossoms. I felt like that was like almost a bit too stereotypical. I, I, I'm always like working on trying to, yeah, um, kind of balance um, things. And it's, it's sort of a bit, a bit about like subtlety as well. So yeah. I think like I have always avoided like the, the cherry blossoms, the maples. I've, I tr I've tried to kind of find something that isn't too much about season because I think that um, in Japan, you know, the seasons 
have like um, particularly strong kind of like um, symbology. Yeah. And I think there's um, there's certain symbology that I kind of choose to kind of avoid, I guess. Yeah. So when you're using fabrics, do you tend to source those fabrics, or do you try and come up with the patterns more organically? Yeah. So it, um, it does probably come a little bit from my mum's Just, collection yeah. as well as um you know the actual ukiyo-e and shunga um prints that i've been looking at as well as like just like finding sort of colors um even in nature and stuff like that so um often you know um i love walking and when i'm out on my walks i sometimes find like a a nice garden with a bit of like wildflower or something like that and i'll take photos of those and um try and incorporate them into my um favorite um designs um I'm also really into William Morris as well, oh, so yeah, yeah. I think like I do try to bring in sort of um, a little bit of like Japanese, but also sort of um, more kind of like Western um, kind of motifs as well, so that um, I feel like that ties it all really nicely into my own kind of upbringing of being, you know, like New Zealand and Japanese. So for those of you that don't know, William Morris was kind of one of the founding fathers of the arts and crafts movement, which was a movement in England which kind of grew out of industrialism and wanting socialist change for workers. And this movement the socialist movement tied into the arts world as there were a lot of artists and craftsmen who felt that this kind of high-end art wasn't a suitable representation for a socialist movement. So essentially the artists and craftsmen who were creating things as a work purpose, so instead of working in a factory condition they decided that the things that were made by hand were of more value even if they weren't churned out at the pace of industrial objects. William Morris was one of the four founders of this movement and he himself was a designer and his firm Morris & Co was one of the firms which created a lot of handmade patterning so very similar to what Aiko does in her work and Morris gained a lot of popularity in Japan as well and part of this was because the arts and crafts movement also was a folk renaissance so that's kind of small town and local crafts which use natural and native wood or textiles or clay and this grew a massive pottery movement in the UK of folk or non-industrially made pottery and the renaissance of pottery in Japan was also occurring where they call it minge but it is actually like a folk crafts and so these two movements kind of joined together in which we had the British man Bernard Leach who travelled to Japan because of his father's work and then the movement growing in Japan of folk pottery which also led to Bernard Leach and Shoji Hamada going back to England and opening St Ives Pottery which was also a arts and crafts pottery kiln. But going back to William Morris he was one of these four founders and arts and crafts generally was favouring the hand and the mind of the individual over mass produced industrial products and this was in architecture, arts, furniture, all, all of these things, but also William Morris was quite famous for his patterns which were used for wallpaper and textiles. So in New Zealand, how do you find that Kiwis react to your art? Yeah, so Kiwis I think have um, been really like um, positive and open towards my work. Um, I haven't really had anyone who's like been very vocal about their, um, you know, anti shunganess or anything towards mm. my work or anything like that. Um, I've found that um, 
you know, I probably started exhibiting, um, I think it was in 2015, um, and from the day I first started showing, I found that, you know, people have really taken to it. Um, I know that, like, the first um, bit of um, kind of, like, media um, that I was involved in was the, um, they uh, had a uh, little article in the Christchurch press and they weren't able to put a photo of my work so they chose to photograph um, like a side profile picture of me in a kimono instead um, and there was like a tiny little wee photo in the like top corner of one of the works where the genitalia wasn't um, visible so it was a little bit more tame um, and I just yeah I did think that that was quite funny so obviously like you know um, there have been some restrictions, but I do think that in general, like, um, your people have been very warm towards yeah. it and very, you know, like, um, inviting. So you started exhibiting after Elam, but before Japan? In terms of, yeah, so I started showing in 2015. So my first show was in um, Christchurch and Auckland. Um, so they're kind of like open one night apart, essentially. Um, and then, yeah, two years later in 2017, I headed on over to Japan to do a master's in fine art, yeah. So you obviously incorporate quite a lot of your Japanese heritage. Do you incorporate much Kiwi culture into your paintings and things? I don't think that it's like necessarily um, obviously Kiwi, but I think like um, recently I've been um, bringing in sort of like uh, motifs, such as like oak trees and things like that. I know that that's um, not inherently um, Kiwi, but I do feel like when I was back in Christchurch um, over the um, um, sort of pandemic, um, I was um, stuck here for 11 months at one point when I was trying to go to um, Australia. Um, but I, I spent a lot of time in Hagley Park and I, um, I sort of started to move away from the Matsu pine, which was like something that I was obsessively drawing at the time, and started like um, bringing in the oaks. Um, and then um, I think I also did like some kimono patterns with like um, the acorns as well, like and called it like nuts or something. I can't remember, <laughs> like um, just like um, things like that. So it's not, I would say that it's not um, really like um, a strong kind of theme in my work. Um, but I think that it's something that I want to visit more because um, I think that there's a lot of potential in, um, you know, like um, Kiwi imagery um, as well. Yeah. Like you're gradually introducing more western elements yeah 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 for sure yeah. i'm trying to sort of find a balance because i don't want it to i think when i first started doing shunga it was sort of very um inspired by shunga and now i feel like i'm starting to find inspiration from other artists as well um they do tend to be artists that were inspired by japanese artwork anyway which is sort of interesting but like i've also really liked um looking at like Aubrey Beardsley um, and like Egon Sheila and stuff like that so like um, they're all kind of like old masters there's not so many contemporary artists mm. in, in that list but um, definitely bringing in a little bit more sort of like western influence as yeah. well yeah I find that that's another thing about uh, European painters is you don't really realize how many have actually been influenced by Japanese art like you said Aubrey Beardsley who was a British painter he was influenced by Shunga Prince and Elon Sheila was actually influenced by Hokusai so Ukiyo-e woodblock prints. So New Zealand or Japan which do you think is more sexually open and receptive to the subject matter? I'll have to say that it's um, definitely New Zealand. <laughs> um, I think that um, it's really interesting because it's, um, you know, um, Japan, the East, was definitely more open towards sex um, during the time period that, um, you know, um, Shunga flourished. So 17th, 19th century Japan was incredibly open and it was... Um, only with the introduction of like um, Christianity and Western trade mm. that it started to um, change. So um, suddenly you have um, 
the um, community saying to think that there is some shame in this and it is taboo and um, it's something that should be censored. Um, and so um, now you have a modern day Japan where they're kind of in this like limbo where they're, they're realizing, they're recognizing that, you know, Shunga is um, taking, um, you know, a lot, a lot of people are taking a lot of interest in it. You know, you had the um, 2013 British Museum exhibition of Shunga prints, um, and it was only um, maybe I think like two or three years later that Japan was finally able to have an exhibition of the same scale um, of Shunga prints because you know there was a lot of issues around like funding, and you know um, a lot of the museums didn't want to. Um, actually host it. Um, so, you know, like Japan's definitely um, taking a while to, to come around to, I think you can even be like jailed, I think, or like um, fined for making erotic work. It's interesting though, because you see a lot of parts of Japan where it feels as though sex would be highly celebrated. You know, there's sex stores in Tokyo and things like that. And then Japan obviously blew up on social media and online for having the penis festival and there's parts of culture like that which seem as though it would be more sexually open. I definitely think it's um yeah a bit more open in New Zealand. I definitely think there's a lot more conversations around um, sex and a lot more um, positivity and empowering empowerment around it and a lot more you know um women starting to publish like um erotica and um you know a lot more kind of like feminist pornography and all sorts of things i think that you know we're reclaiming um that um stage as well now so i definitely yeah definitely think new zealand <laughs> yeah there are certain traditions i guess um but yeah, and the, the other thing is like um, you go to the you know convenience stores and there's um, those like super erotic um, manga books or like magazines um, just like there with like children walking through the space and it, that feels a lot more confront like that kind of um, form of erotic if it actually feels a lot more confronting to me than anything um, that was made in the Edo period. Yeah, and that like, you know, like these um, manga um, characters do generally look quite young. Um, I think this is the thing what I'm, is, is what I'm saying is like it feels like, to me, that feels a lot more confronting, a lot mm. more disturbing um, than a shunga print. But somehow, <laughs> you know, that's not allowed. Yeah. It takes a long time for the museums to, to take it on board. And then in convenience stores, <laughs> you have all of these these um manga just there available for people so, yeah so do you exhibit in japan do you have somebody who represents you over there like a gallery that represents you yeah so i've got one in tokyo and they are in um akasaka mm -hmm. um and um they're they actually, um, what they often do with my works is they are a little bit cautious. So um, the most of the um, overtly sexual works are inside the gallery and on the, they've got like a display wall that faces the street um, and on that wall they generally get me to make something that's a little bit more tame. Um, it, it's still like, you know, very much my style, um, definitely sexy, but it's um, like there wouldn't be any genitalia in it, for example, um, and um, generally they're a little bit more clothed, like there's not as much like skin showing kind of thing. Yeah, so um, yeah, I, I think they've started doing that so that, you know, when, when possible police walk past, the, there's no like issue. <laughs> And I also noticed that in some of your works, or quite a few of your works, you haven't got any heads or anything on the bodies. Um, is that a stylistic choice? That one was an interesting one. I feel like I'm still kind of figuring it out myself in some ways, but I think um, that initially it was um, for composition sort of reasons. Um, I, I found that the faces were distracting. Mm. Um, and I think that I don't actually find it 
that that's the case when I look at Shunga. But what I do find is that it's the last thing I look at. And I think that my eyes are going obviously first to the main part of the narrative, which is the genitalia, which is actually the point of Shunga. Like they often um, enlarge the genitalia because that is like the, the main main narrative that's going in, on in the story. But, you know, obviously um, for me, I also was looking at the patterns and the scenario and I felt like the last thing I looked at was the faces. And to me, I find um, that a lot of the faces are generally quite like mask-like. They're quite... Um, like no. Yeah, kind of exactly. Like yeah, so they, they were often, um, for me, something that I just like wasn't that interested in. And I remember having like a discussion with, discussion with my tutor at the time um, that was Imogen Taylor, um, so she, um, wonderful artist, I really admire her, but she, um, she was sort of saying to me like, those heads, they're just quite distracting in your mm. works. Should we see what it will be like with, without them? So I started making a series of works that was um, just the fabric and the hands. And I think those like little curled up toes and like tensed fingertips and stuff, those were quite um, interesting to me. And I felt like um, they were um, powerful enough to, to mm. tell the story. Um, and over time, I think um, what I've discovered is that um, it's, it's quite ideal um, to leave the faces out because then I can leave the identity of the, yeah. the figures out of the story. And I think um, so one thing that I'm struggling with, I guess, is like um, the, in my mind, the figures are colourless. Um, they're the colour of the paper. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people do see because the paper is generally like cream or white, they do often think that it is white um, figures. But in my mind, um, they are actually, they are colourless. So I think I am trying to leave race out of it as well. I think um, I don't want to sexualise any particular person or figure, or, you know. So I think that leaving out the heads um, has gradually over time sort of um, taken on a little bit more of a kind of conceptual um, thing as well but it's it's funny because I think I'm still kind of figuring it out yeah <laughs> but you haven't had anybody really making too many comments about that no I did have a problem with too feminine though I think that was like said by one of my male um, tutors and I think nowadays I'm sort of thinking like what's wrong with that I actually kind of want to have a more feminine approach um, regarding these works because I think that um, really they do speak more possibly to my um, female clientele. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think that it's important to have more of a feminist perspective when it comes to sexual content and imagery. Like, we've got so many <laughs> avenues of, you know, sexual imagery, which is dictated by men. So some of the more delicate and feminine works that you do are a better and fresher perspective anyway. So where can people find your work? Yeah, so um, I, if you want to just um, see it um, digitally, it's um, I do have a website, ikorobinson.com, and I also am pretty um, good on my Instagram too. I do post occasionally, um, so you can find me there, um, Iko Robinson, I think it is. Um, and um, in terms of galleries, um, you can see my work at PG Gallery 192 in Christchurch. I've got a show coming up at Milford Galleries um, in Dunedin um, and uh, some at Fox Jensen. I, I also just um, got some in Tokyo too. So that's um, at um, Maduedo Gallery as well. So yeah, lots of places to see my work physically and digitally. <laughs> yeah. So at the time I recorded this, Ico did have a show opening in Queenstown at Milford Galleries, but that's since finished. And she's also changed galleries from Fox Jensen, where I work, to Gal Langsford, which is also in Auckland. Yeah, it's always um, sad um, leaving galleries, and um, Fox Jensen has been amazing in my career, but um, I think that I'm looking forward to the next um, 
little sort of challenge, I guess. And your Instagram at Aiko Robinson, A I K O Robinson, is probably one of my favourite artist Instagrams as well. I love the videos that you upload where you're doing all those really intricate details that are honestly quite unbelievable as well. I love doing that stuff. It's my favourite part, except for when there's a deadline approaching, at which point I'm like, why did I do this to myself? You know? <laughs> so, that was my talk with Aiko. And there are actually a lot of Japanese Kiwi artists in New Zealand, but there's also a lot of Japanese artists who have been living in New Zealand for a long time. Even though Aiko isn't in New Zealand anymore, she's still practicing as a Kiwi and Japanese artist, and she's still represented by galleries in New Zealand, so you can find her work at Milford Galleries, PG Gallery, and also at Gow Langsford in Auckland. I think hopefully soon she'll have some representation in Australia as well. If you'd like to see more of Aiko's work, go on her Instagram or her website and take a look. And if you're interested in purchasing, you can reach out to any of those galleries as well. And they'll give you some idea of what stock they have and the prices and things like that. I've got one of her works. My sibling has one of her works and a few of my friends have also bought her works as well. They're amazing. I love them so much. And Aiko is one of those mixed scholarship kids. So if you're interested in studying in Japan or are thinking about doing an exchange program in Japan, those kinds of scholarships come up through the embassies in New Zealand and also through universities and things like that. So you can have a look at those online on the embassy website or through your universities i probably have some idea as well and that's all for today i will talk to you guys again soon have a lovely day week whatever whenever you're listening to this and i will catch you next time bye